Today is a much requested video. We're going to be solving the Basel problem the way Euler did almost three centuries ago. And this is just plain beautiful. It is an amazing solution. Although the Basel problem as of today has several different solution developments, this one is, in my opinion, the best out of them all. Why is that so? Well, I've got three reasons for that. One, it's the OG way. Euler was the first person ever to solve the Basel problem, right? Number two, it's Euler. Number three, it is just plain beautiful. I mean, it's just so elegant and yet so simple. I really do love the solution development. And as a bonus, we're also going to be solving the Basel problem the way Complex Man would. And by that, I mean we're going to be using residues. We start off with the Euler solution, which makes use of Euler's amazing infinite product representation of the sine function, where you can write sine x as x times this infinite product over the positive integers k of 1 minus x squared by pi squared times k squared. Link in the description below for a proof of this. And we need a transformation to get things started for us. And that transformation is taking x to the pi x world. So this implies that you have sine pi x on the left hand side. And on the right, you have pi x times this infinite product over k of 1 minus x squared by k squared. Now let's expand this infinite product that we have. So that gives us on the right hand side pi x times 1 minus x squared by 1 squared is 1 and then we have 1 minus x squared by 2 squared which is a 4. Similarly we have 1 minus x squared by 9 and 1 minus x squared by 16 and so on and so forth. And I'm going to multiply this pi x term with the first term we have in the product expansion and that gives me a pi x minus pi x cubed term up front being multiplied with all of these other terms in the infinite product expansion and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply out this pi x term with everything else. So multiplying it with all the ones in the product expansion gives me a pi x term of course and it's multiplying with these quadratic terms that gets interesting. That's where stuff actually gets interesting. So I have a negative pi x cubed by 4 term up front, minus pi x cubed by 9, minus pi x cubed by 16, and so on and so forth. I do not need the other terms in this infinite series expansion that I now have after multiplying out everything. Except for one term, I do need one more term out of this expansion, and that is the term we get when we multiply this pi x cubed term by 1. That gives me a pi x cubed term over here after multiplying out with the 1s. And now I'd like to factor out a pi x cubed term from this series. So I have pi x minus pi times x cubed times 1 plus 1 by 4 plus 1 by 9 plus 1 by 16 plus so on and so forth, ring a bell? This is in fact the Basel problem, right? It's the sum over the positive integers k of 1 by k squared, and that's exactly what we're out to solve. Now, how exactly do we solve this given the mess on the right-hand side? Well, that's the trick. We're actually going to solve it using the cleaner left-hand side that, recall, was the sine of pi x. So the plan here is to expand sine pi x as an infinite series and we compare the coefficients of the x cubed terms and that'll solve the Basel problem. So sine x has this really nice infinite series expansion as the sum over the non-negative integers k of negative 1 to the k times x to the 2k plus 1 divided by 2k plus 1 factorial. So replacing x by pi times x yields the same structure except for a pi to the 2k plus 1 term up here. And for the x cubed term, we need k to be equal to 1. So using that value of k, we have negative 1 cubed 
times pi cubed divided by 3 factorial, which is 6. And this equals negative pi times our basal problem boy. And we see here that negative 1 to the third power is negative 1, and that cancels out the negative sign on the right-hand side quite nicely. And all that's left to do is multiply by the reciprocal of pi. And this implies that the sum over k of 1 by k squared equals pi squared by 6. And that was how Euler did it. Okay, now let's try residues, which is itself a pretty cool way to evaluate infinite series. So the trick here is that the sum from negative to positive infinity of f of n, where n is not a pole of the function f of z, equals the negative of the sum of residues of pi times the cotangent of pi z times f of z at the poles of f of z. And I might make a future video on the proof of this formula as well as its alternating series counterpart, but for now I've linked in the description a PDF explaining the proofs along with some nice illustrative examples. And the PDF is pretty well written in terms of detail as well as being self-explanatory. So do check that out if you're not familiar with the whole residues for infinite series thing. Anyway, for the purpose of our Basel problem here, we need to define a function f of z as 1 by z squared because that'll turn the series here into a sum from negative infinity to negative 1 of 1 by n squared plus a sum from 1 to infinity of 1 by n squared, where we skip the n equals 0 term because the function f of z has a pole of order 2 at z equal to 0. And all we need to evaluate these the sum of infinite series, and by the way, this case for the negative integers is pretty easy to deal with because 1 by n squared is an even function anyway, so we can perform an n to negative n transformation later and combine the two sums. We need the residues of the function pi times the cotangent of pi z times f of z, which of course translates to pi times cotangent pi z divided by z squared. And the cotangent function here also has a simple pole at z equal to 0. So we're going to have to resort to a Laurent series expansion for this function in order to figure out the residue. Now, the residue at z equal to 0 will be the coefficient of the 1 by z term in the Laurent series expansion. But to find the Laurent series expansion for the function box in yellow, we first need a Laurent series expansion for the cotangent of z. Now, the cotangent function can be expanded as the cosine of z divided by the sine of z. And this, of course, can be written as the cosine of z equal to the cotangent of z times sine z. Now, what exactly is the benefit of writing this? Well, the cosine function, we know it's Laurent series expansion. It equals the sum over the non-negative integers k of negative 1 to the k times x to the 2k divided by 2k factorial. And for the sine function, we know that it sorts out to the sum over k again of negative 1 to the k times x to the 2k plus 1 divided by 2k plus 1 factorial. And for the Laurent series of the cotangent function, which despite being unknown, we know its shape, right? Because we know that the cotangent function has a simple pole at z equal to 0. So that means there's going to be a b sub 1 divided by z term, as well as, of course, the a sub 0 and a sub 1 times z, and so on and so forth. So the plan here is pretty simple. All we have to do is multiply everything on the right-hand side term by term and compare the coefficients with the left-hand side. So I'll leave it to you to fill in the details. You'll find that b sub 1 equals 1, a sub 0 equals 0, and a sub 1 equals negative 1 by 3. And these are the only terms we'll be needing, and I'll show you exactly why shortly. 
So anyway, this implies that we have the first couple terms of the cotangent functions Laurent series. That's 1 by z and then a 0, so you just skip to negative 1 by 3 times z. Now we needed the Laurent series for this function, cotangent pi z times pi divided by z squared. So transform the z variable into pi times z. That gives you pi z down here and pi up here. Multiplying by pi means, again, you're rid of this pi and you have a pi squared term here. Dividing by z squared means that you have 1 by z cubed here. And here you have a z to the negative 1, as in z in the denominator. Okay, cool. That means we have the coefficient of the 1 by z term, meaning that the residue equals negative pi squared by 3. So all that's left is to piece together all of this really cool mathematics. So this implies the sum. Now the sum was from negative 1 to negative infinity of 1 by n squared. And under a transformation from n to negative n, this gives you the sum from 1 to infinity of still 1 by n squared because 1 by n squared is an even function, plus the sum from 1 to infinity of 1 by n squared again. So we're just going to combine them. Right, this is twice the sum. And this equals the negative of the residue. So that's a positive pi squared by 3. And this here implies that the sum over the positive integers of 1 by n squared equals pi squared by 6, which is a really cool solution development indeed. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Mention in the comments which method you liked better. For me, it's obviously Euler. Anyway, be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.